And now I would like to ask our colleague from Indonesia to take the podium. to such distinguished people. Um, I was just telling Jaime uh, before that he, he kind of stole my thunder because my, my presentation is going to be essentially what happens when uh, a large government uh, with 300,000 schools and about 60 million students <laughs> actually listens to Jaime and actually does what he told me to do. So I was very lucky to have people like Jaime and Andreas Schleicher as my mentor when I first took this job. And so we'll be talking about Indonesia and what we did now, the only statistic that you need to know about where we started was about the learning crisis. So like Jaime explained, we knew we were in a learning crisis even before COVID. But what COVID did was actually created a far more burning platform for us to actually make those leaps. So COVID, despite the learning deceleration that it caused, actually created a far faster impetus for us to transform education. It allowed me to take much bigger risks with what we were supposed to do. The good thing about being at the bottom because of the PISA ranking and results is that the only way is up and the amount of risk that you can take to innovate is also very high. You get, you earn that right to do things that you haven't done before. So our concept is about emancipated learning and this is about creating an educational system to change it from school as a burden to a much more joyful experience. If we are going to create lifelong learners, they have to associate education with something that's engaging and that's fun. Um, we want students to have power and agency, teachers to have power and agency. You will see this as a consistent theme in our transformation. Theme one is that less is more. Theme two is that delegating autonomy and power, giving more agency to every person is actually a far lower risk move than the opposite, trying to create robots basically to do the set uh, thing that we think as governments teachers should do. So what do we do? The first bold thing that we did was we removed subject-based high stakes testing completely. We removed it and instead we made a formative assessment that is on national scale. It's all available digitally, it's on the cloud. And basically it focuses on numeracy and literacy. We learned a lot from PISA and assessing this. This created a paradigm shift in entire schools. You've got four million teachers confused Googling what literacy and numeracy is, okay, for the first two years of this implementation. And for the first time they realize that what's important is not what I teach my kids in terms of rote information, but actually how I teach my kids. And whether they're able to problem solve and logically reason with qualitative and quantitative information. The other thing uh, that we did, we became one of the first countries in our national assessment to include uh, character surveys to assess the risk of bullying, intolerance, and uh, sexual uh, violence, sexual harassment. With curriculum, we rolled out a new curriculum, except we did it differently. The last time we implemented a curriculum, it took five to seven years to force everyone to change. We decided to do things a little bit upside down. We offered it freely to schools. Within one and a half years, 80% of schools opted in to our new curriculum. We did that in breakneck speed just because we didn't force the schools. We gave them the choice to opt into the new curriculum or not. Uh, we were shocked by these results. 80% of schools are now adopting this new curriculum. What is it about the new curriculum? First, some of the subject matters, we cut probably 30 to 40% of the subject content. We focus on depth instead of breadth. Second big change we did, we took 20% of class time gave it to the teachers for project-based learning. You decide. We set key themes on climate change, interreligious tolerance, entrepreneurship, arts and culture, whatever you want. We gave that back to the teachers. And we allow teachers to be co-creators of the curriculum. And for the first time ever in the Indonesian history, teachers were allowed to move down one to two years behind to catch up everybody in class, or for the faster kids in their classroom, go one or two years advance. We gave them the freedom. We think it's the most silly thing ever that everyone, no matter how impoverished the region is or how wealthy a city is, everyone studies at the same level no matter where they are. This does not make sense. If you are going to teach at the right level, teach at whatever level the student competencies are in. And finally, the, th the third thing we did, which is what is always the challenge, if you don't align to what the university entrance exam is, which is the only high stakes test that we have, because there's a limited spots of universities, 
none of these incentives flow back to the curriculum itself. So we removed subject-based testing from the university entrance exams, aligned it with the problem-solving numeracy and literacy uh, aptitude tests that we do for national assessments. Next. We really went back to basics. What we did was pre-service teacher education, we focused on clinical practice, practice-oriented. Before, it was predominantly theory. Now, teachers actually learn in schools instead of learning theory in a classroom or a university. The second thing is we really revamped our leadership development course called Master Teachers. It's just another way of saying the future generation of principals and superintendents. What was the biggest difference? Instead of selecting them based on some kind of a competency test, we selected these master teachers who are the future principals of schools based on their ability to take risks, to innovate, and their ability in understanding the fundamental philosophies. The program did not gear itself towards pedagogy. The program geared itself towards leadership, affecting other teachers, and mindset shifts. And finally, forming learning communities. Teachers do not learn best from government. Teachers learn best from other teachers, fellow practitioners, just like in any other craft, the way Jaime said this. So, We've designed a new system that really focuses on the bottom of the pyramid, okay? That really focuses on the bottom of the pyramid. The top 20% of your educational system probably does not need the government support. It is really about that bottom 50%, whatever your criteria is, bottom 50%, it can be bottom 60%. So for these schools that have the lowest literacy scores, what we did was, I'm sure some of you are familiar with programs like Teach for America or Teach First. We took that program times 100. We sent close to 100,000 university students to these schools to actually teach numeracy and literacy, and we paid for it. And the data actually showed a significant improvement. We are still not sure why, okay? But the data has showed, uh, based on control-based trials, that there's a massive jump when we send university students to go help teach literacy and numeracy in these regions. The second thing we did was we scrapped completely this philosophy of adults choosing books to put in libraries in students and instead focus on what kids wanted to read for fun, period. And we sent 15 million of these books to these schools. Uh, it was amazing watching kids in the most impoverished areas of Indonesia finally spend time in the library and deliver that love of uh, reading. And of course, the first time ever in the history of Indonesia, we did differentiated budgeting. We actually gave more money to the schools in the more impoverished regions. And then finally, we're talking about 60 million students, 300,000 schools. We did not have an option but to leverage technology. We have a 400-person technology team, volunteers that came from the private sector to come and develop proprietary and free-to-use tools for our population. All of these are geared towards educators, teachers. They are not geared towards student usage. They are geared towards the adults in the schools, the principals and the teachers. We created a nas that national assessment that I talked to you about before can now be accessed by every single teacher and principal to the minute detail. They can double click on anything. They can double click on what is the, the uh, uh, incidence or risk of incidence of sexual violence in my school. They can check numeracy. They can see how their school is performing versus their peers, etc. We created an entire e-commerce store for schools to be able to improve their product offering, book offering, equipment. And we also created a super app for teachers that is now being used by close to 2 million teachers where it's basically an online continuous learning university. The best part about this app, outside of being rated 4.8, which is the highest rated app in the government has ever made in Indonesia, the best part about it is that the content, the modules, are now teacher submitted modules have overtaken government provided modules whereby teachers are now sharing their learnings to each other, which is how it's meant to be. Okay. What are the lessons that we learn? First and foremost, that this doesn't work in a piecemeal approach, unfortunately. One of the best things that I did when I took this job in the beginning was ask the president to please combine lower and higher education. Because one part of this cycle that is not part of the transformation, the whole incentive structure of the system fails. So the first learning is that you need to do all the sectoral aspects, curriculum, teacher training, uh, assessment,
but also across all uh, uh, stages, from early childhood to university entrance. Otherwise, it breaks. Um, the other part is it's really about engaging the community. That should be what I believe is the role of government. How to create that sense of autonomy and agency, choice to the schools, no matter what level of competency they are in. One of the most nonsensical arguments I have ever heard about why we shouldn't do these radical reforms is because teachers that have low competency are not ready for autonomy. I throw back the question to them, do you think a teacher without autonomy can ever create learning in a classroom? It's impossible. It is impossible, no matter their level of competency. And finally, technology is a tool to use to enable our teachers, just like Jaime said before. Technology should be focused not on replacing the teachers, but making them into superheroes, making them into uh, teachers that are able to create content, teachers that are able to see formative assessments of their students in real time, uh, discriminate between different groups in class, what kind of homeworks do you want to personalize and tailor to them, and to reduce the painful administrative burden that is the educational system. Automate all those processes away so they can finally have time to do what they're meant to do which is teach. Thank you very much.